Welcome to Side Notes. I'm your host, Reginald Argue. I'm here in the City Hall here in Toronto with the City Councillor, Mike Layden. Mike, you know, one of the biggest things, many of us Canadians, we have this story when we had a chance to talk to your late father, Jack Layden. Myself, it was at the Vancouver Pride Parade a couple years ago, and I could still remember what he had to say when I talked to him about a certain situation. And he was saying it was a mixed match of laws in Canada. You'd like to see a standard law in regards to this you know, what the problem I was bringing to him. And to me, it showed me that it was a politician that Canada greatly needed. And you know what? I feel that when we lost him, we lost so much. But hearing you that night, when you're standing there and you're telling Walmart and the big box store over in Kensington, not during my watch, I felt that what you're saying, I closed my eyes and I felt like I was listening to your late father. I mean, what I want you to talk about is what were the words that he shared with you over the years, especially when you won as city councillor here in Toronto? Well, I think some of the, I, I have a couple memories of, of important things that, uh, pieces of information he bestowed on me. One, uh, after I finished university, I was looking for a job, as a lot of young people do. And, and after a couple of months of looking, uh, I had two job offers, uh, one, both very entry level, both uh, both were very low, low on the, on the, uh, on the ladder, um, but they were both pretty good opportunities. One was with, um, was with a, uh, a consulting firm going out and doing work around nuclear waste facilities in the in around the world, and one was working for a national environmental charity. Now, working for the the consultant would have been uh, a lot more money, would have meant uh, a lot more opportunity to move up a ladder very quickly. Um, but it would have been doing something that um, I didn't necessarily agree with. And then the job with the environmental group wouldn't, wouldn't pay very much. Um, there isn't a lot of opportunities to, to move up. There's not a lot of jobs in the organization or in, or in not-for-profits and environmental groups in the country. There's, there's, there's a few, but not many. And, um, uh, but I would be given the opportunity to do something I really felt passionate about and something that I really thought would make a difference. And, and I went to him with this, with, with this question, and I said, you know what, Dad, what, what do you, what's your advice? And he said, look, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but do what, do what you think um, w will allow you to have more of an impact in the world. And so I took the job with the environmental firm and got paid peanuts for, for, for three or four years, uh, but I, 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 don't, um, I, I don't regret the decision for a second. And it was the same advice he gave me when, uh, when I was approached by people in the neighborhood to, um, to run for city council because the, the local city councillor was stepping down. He was someone I supported. Um, I went to my dad and went for, he gave me the very same advice. He said, look, take the job that will allow you to have the, the, the greatest difference in the world and in the issues that you want to deal with. And I loved my job. I, I would go back to it in an instant working on environmental policy in, in the province uh, but uh, this this opportunity would allow me to make more significant change, and and I've I've used that opportunity to to do as much as I can in the in the short time I've been here. And you actually in the environmental organization you're involved with, I think you reached the level of uh, outreach director. What were some of the biggest policies that you felt were affecting Ontario and still affected to this day that? desperately need to be addressed. Well, my title was Deputy Outreach Director, and there's a thing in the not-for-profit world, if you, uh, instead of giving you raises in money, they give you a new title. And so I, I quickly worked my way up the titles, not so quick with the money. Um, they, I got to work on a lot of projects to do with protecting sources of drinking water in the province, uh, in implementation of the province's Clean Water Act. I, I, I enjoyed that. Um, eventually, I ended up working on um, the uh, Green Energy Act and, and, and the, the Green Energy and Green Economy Act. And it was a new piece of legislation in 2008 that would make Ontario a global leader in, in renewable energy conservation and, and conservation, uh, as well as create uh, thousands of jobs in, in, in the process. And so uh, I, I coordinated a group called the Green Energy Act Alliance, and it was a group of a whole bunch of different kinds of stakeholders. It was the the, the renewable energy industry it was environmental groups it was farmers and it was um, uh, it, it was trade labor unions and they were all working together uh, to come up with something that would really work and for the most part I think it worked possibly too well because of uh, the contracts then got uh, got got eaten up very quickly um, that that 
Act still remains and uh, and it gets revised every couple of years. Uh, and that work, I'm, I'm very proud of what I contributed to, to that act. And when you talk about biofuels, you know, what, do you see the province of Ontario eventually getting into, let's say, bio corn, bio uh, canola, bio hemp, bio, you know, all these different fuels that make biodiesel, but do you see us getting into it in a greater, you know, length and at the same time, uh, you know, starting to become less, uh, uh, less involved with the oil and starting to move towards something that can be renewed all the time. Well, I think that there's there's a hope that that, that is the case. With with biofuels, there's a, uh, the debate is around how much food should we be putting into fuel? Um, so when you can create food, wh- why don't you create that rather than create fuel? There's ways of doing it so that it's the, uh, it's, it's the remainder, it's the uh, it's it's the uh, the byproduct of food production. You can use that for biofuels, uh, and then sometimes you you the the land is best suited to grow uh, crops that are, are best used and uh, used for fuels. Uh, I think the hope is that you find a balance. So you 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 have some biofuel component. You have some component from from wind energy. You have some component from solar. You have a good component of hydro. Uh, and the key is 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 a good balance uh, of of all of those things. Um, where we can start offsetting our, our fossil fuel uh, uh, use, like we're doing in Ontario by eliminating our coal-fired power plants, um, we should be going down those opportunities. I, I think what you'll probably find is as years go by and as battery power um, improves to such a degree that rather than go down uh, the, the internal combustion engine that relies on diesel and, 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 and biofuels and, and more conventional fuels, that that will uh, that will be replaced by uh, a battery operated system simply because the the, the technology's got got zero emissions depending on the source of the electricity um, and and the battery the battery technology have already increased so dramatically well uh, that um, that that might in fact just be the, the the more sustainable option. Could we actually see a car one day that, you know, it needs a little charge to begin with, but eventually, you know, it starts recharging itself as it's driving along? Well, that right now, when you see the, the a lot of the hybrids have internal systems like that, that um, that the braking system, for instance, is what recharges the, uh, the, uh, the, the battery. I, I don't know if you could ever get to the point where you're, in fact, going without something being inputted, energy being inputted. I think my... If I remember my laws of thermodynamics properly, um, you, you, you're always going to be losing a little bit of energy in the transfer. Uh, so as you, you like, you might be able to replenish it a little bit with the braking system, for instance. Another good example of this is um, in your in your home, you you expend gas to heat your hot water, but there's actually drain recovery units that can capture some of the hot some of the heat as it's going down the drain and put it back into your uh, to to your system. Uh, but you're only capturing a little bit of that because heat's lost in in all when it comes out of the shower, when it goes down the drain, and when it touches uh, when when you're having your shower. So you're not recapturing it all, but you are gaining some of it back, and that's just about efficient use of 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 your whatever system that you're dealing with. And you know, since you became city councilor here in Toronto, I noticed that one thing you're involved with the you know fair trade. Can you talk a little bit about that? So that was a project that uh, I, I was approached by the folks at, uh, at, at Fair Trade Canada, and they came to my office and said, look, this is what other municipalities are doing. Vancouver had been declared a fair trade town, and this is a, an international designation for municipalities or ta- cities and towns that, um, that have made changes to promote uh, uh, fair trade products uh, and the, the consumption of fair trade products. And fair trade being that when we're dealing with our, our neighbors uh, in, in developing countries in, uh, around the world, that we're treating the workers and the environment with a sense of dignity and, and, and the respect that they deserve. And I think that that's something that a lot of people in Toronto want to know that we're contributing to. So the fair trade designation not only has to do with how the city conducts its business, um, so what coffee do we serve at public meetings, for instance, but also um, are there stores that serve or uh, stores or restaurants that carry uh, fair trade products and we we essentially met all the criteria already um, we just needed to draw the city government needed to give its endorsement to to gain this status and for and a year later after uh, after 
this group, uh, Fair Trade Toronto, did the work in the community to make sure that it, that that enough stores carried the product, uh, the products that need to be, and most of them coffee, sugar, stuff like that, bananas, um, that we could then uh, get that designation, and sure enough, we did. And also, you know, when your late father was involved in the municipal election, uh, excuse me, municipal politics here in Toronto, uh, there, and saw the movie last night on your late father, and it he talked during the movie, it talked about there was five thousand homeless, uh, I think, in the nineties. The recent report had homeless here in Toronto at uh, 5,200 and around there. You know, 15 to 17 percent are, are military, 10 percent are seniors, which has actually doubled in mm -hmm. only a couple of years. You know, what policies do you feel have to be put forth in order to correct this problem? Because, you know, I, I feel like if we don't address it soon, we're sitting on a quagmire in such a sense that everything is going to get a lot worse. I think it's two things. One is we, we need to have uh, more affordable housing because we, we, we have a waiting list of 50,000 people for, for, uh, at our uh, TC, uh, TCH, which is the Toronto Housing Corporation. Uh, we have a list of 50,000 waiting for homes. And the fact is that that's, uh, uh, that's appalling uh, that we, don't, we, we, we simply don't have homes for people in the city of Toronto. In a city as rich as this, we, we, we can't accommodate for uh, people to have the basic thing, uh, a basic thing like affordable housing. Um, so we need to make investments in affordable housing, and that's going to require a greater hand from the federal government because we don't have the resources to provide that, uh, and, and, and nor is it part of the city's sort of core mandate. Uh, we do, and we will continue to, uh, because there's no national housing strategy, which is what we so sorely uh, need in this country. Um, the second piece is the, the idea of transitional housing, or uh, like housing with a little bit of care for folks who need it. Um, so when we saw the, the sort of shift in the provincial government from treating um, and, and, and housing people in, 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 in facilities that provided a very basic level of care for those struggling with mental health issues or addiction, uh, now those people are out on the street. And that's, uh, th that, that sort of just reinforces their, their, their conditions and, their and, 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 and the concerns that they have with their, uh, their, their health. And so what we need to do is be focusing on providing affordable housing, but also providing options for folks that need a little bit of support. And, you know, at that meeting that what, uh, my wife Lisa and I met you at, uh, the one that was a big box store in, in Kensington, I noticed recently there's been a prohibition, uh, excuse me, um, been a temporary hold on uh, the decision for a year until the city of uh, Toronto has a chance to do uh, more um, study on it, right? What do you feel uh, would happen if that did come into being, not only on a community level, but we're also talking on the social level in Kensington, if the big box store were allowed to happen? Well, I think you, you see it um, in, in small towns when a large retailer, any type of retailer, but when a large big box that, that sort of has everything and gives everything at a discount, when it comes into a community, uh, people go there for, out of convenience and they stop going to the small stores that used to make up the main street and then all of a sudden you end up in a in a situation where your main streets closed down and everyone's shopping at the walmart uh and unfortunately that's that that's what could very well happen uh, to not only the kensington market neighborhood but also to uh, the the other main streets that are adjacent to the site uh, college street in little italy will will be impacted the uh the the, the street uh, queen street west will be impacted and we have a struggling neighborhood there on dundas that's just trying to reinvent itself but not lose the grocer the uh the 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 shoe store the 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 uh the hairstyle the, the hairstylist we're trying to keep those things so that it doesn't turn into a street of restaurants and bars and that's uh that's unfortunately what that what we're facing i think from from a social standpoint um, what it what it does is is it makes our street streets less safe because there's not as many eyes on the street there's not as many small business people out on the street every day um, it also their their employment practices aren't necessarily the best in the world uh, the, instead of having uh, a small business having one or two employees that they that they treat fairly because they're members of the family or um, or, or, or close friends uh, when they're sick they get to take some time off but their jobs wait in there when they come back at a Walmart, you, you, you have a faceless employer that, uh, that, that is able to treat you uh, not like a friend, but as, um, uh, as, as uh, an, an employee, but even less so because you're, you're, 
all the jobs are going to be at the minimum wage uh, level, uh, maybe save some of the upper management, but it's not like there's a whole hierarchy of, of, of corporate uh, Walmart that's going to be working in the neighborhood. It's going to be the, the, the greeters and the cashiers that, uh, that are going to be hired, and they'll be paid on the lower end of the scale. And also, you know, with this big box store that they're proposing, you know, they're, they're making it sound, oh, it's only three stories high. I've heard some people talk during that meeting where they said, well, if you include the elevator, then include the three stories underneath for parking, you're looking at something that's up to seven stories. Well, it's actually three stories is, is technically correct, but they're three stories that are commercial. So the stories are much higher than a residential story. So the building itself will actually be closer to the equivalent of a seven-story building than a five, than a three-story building, uh, because the 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 store the stories on a big box store are just so much taller than the stories on a uh, in in someone's home. Uh, you don't have ten-foot ceilings or twelve-foot ceilings in a store a store like Walmart. You have forty-foot ceilings, so the, the the stories are that much bigger. And you know what is the average size of building within this area? I don't have that no, that that number off the top of my head, uh, but for the most part, um, on on the surrounding streets, we're talking small retail units that are uh, that that are just one single frontage, uh, maybe maybe twelve fifteen feet wide, not a three hundred foot wide uh, frontage like what's being proposed. And, you know, one thing I can't understand with Kensington is that uh, I remember growing up and watching the King of Kensington. Why isn't the, the area of Kensington starting to concentrate on its history, you know, showing people that, that this used to be a program there called King of Kensington, showing all this, you know, celebrating what made it the way it is and then starting to revitalize itself around that? I mean, what's your thoughts on that? Well, they do. They've got a program. I, well, they're designated as a, as a national heritage site. And so there is some some sense of the, the, the history that's in, in the space, but it's always changing. Um, it, it's gone through shifts with different communities coming in and out. Um, and I think that for the most part that's embraced because every community leaves a little, a little bit behind of, of themselves. Maybe it's a fish store or, a, uh, or a, a, like a butcher or something like that. And so you'll find that, um, uh, that, that when you go, there's a little bit of history there just when you walk through the streets. Uh, there is a great celebration, and it's the Sunday of every last Sunday of every month uh, is a car-free day where the streets just get filled with everyone um, who are either selling things or playing music, or and it's quite a beautiful time. So you know, if this big box store were to come into into being, you know, then that uh, that street event could actually uh, you know no longer be. Well, I think the fear is that everyone will be impacted by it because their uh, the, the stores will begin to feel the pinch of. Uh, of their customers going somewhere else. And you know, what other things have you noticed as, as a counselor, uh, other pressing matters that you feel need to be addressed, not only in, you know, in this term, but you feel that you know, are going to take uh, at least uh, two or three more years or even 10 more years to mm -hmm. correct? Well, the city's under undergoing as part of their their initiative to to build more affordable housing. We're we're approaching the federal government, saying we need more money now to to, to build on what sites remain in in the city, uh, to 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 in fact have more affordable housing. Uh, it's called closing the gap, um, and it's about uh, uh, reducing the number of people that are in fact on uh, on the waiting list and and putting them in homes, uh, reducing this gap between the rich and the poor. Um, there's also the, uh, I, I've initiated a energy retrofit strategy that will begin uh, with a pilot program to uh, retrofit 2,000 uh, homes in Toronto, 100 single family homes and 100 uh, multi-unit uh, residential uh, units. Um, and so that'll do energy retrofits on them and, and create hundreds of jobs at the same time. Uh, there's also issues around how our city grows and uh, what, what transit needs are there. Uh, so we're uh, sort of having a constant debate about public transit in the city of Toronto, about what we need to do uh, with, uh, with all the people to get them moving around to address our traffic issues, which are also fairly significant. Um, so those are all things that we'll be working on for the, for, for the next couple of years. We're trying to implement our city's uh, cycling strategy, which, which means putting, building, more, uh, building more bicycle infrastructure, lanes, uh, pathways, as well as parking all across the city to give folks uh, uh, that, that are currently biking a, a safer alternative 
uh, and and some a, a bit more in the way of uh, of services, but also to encourage more people to get out of their cars and get onto bikes, um, because it's just a much more sustainable way of uh, of us running a city. And you know, finally, do you want to leave your website just in case you know we haven't covered any areas and someone may want to look at it going, well, I, I wish you would have asked that sure. question so that way they can contact you. It's MikeLayton.to and uh, you can also email me at counselor underscore Layton at toronto.ca and we're very pleased to hear from anybody. Well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Reginald.